we hear Jesus contrasting blessings with some warnings. The way of life versus the way of death. The Lord Jesus is at the center of life. We rise for the invocation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the sixth chapter. And Jesus came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon, who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all the crowd sought to touch him, for power came out from him and healed them all. And Jesus lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For so their fathers did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Dear friends in Christ, I'm currently serving on a search committee to bring a new professor to Concordia University. What amazed me when we talked about the uh, talk to the candidates, how eager they were to serve at CUW because they love our Christian mission. That CUW is a Lutheran higher education community committed to helping students develop in mind, body, and spirit for service to Christ in the church and in the world. Jesus Christ is central to everything we do here at CUW, and that brings us to our fascinating text. Jesus Christ is central to everything that's said or done there. Even the blessings, or beatitudes as they're called, while seemingly talking about our, our good behavior, actually highlight Christ and his saving mission. Another important feature of this text is the contrast between good and evil, the way of life and the way of death. Many gospel readings for this epiphany have highlighted that difference. In our text, we read about a large number of people, both Jews and Gentiles, coming from all over the land to hear Jesus and be healed. But in these verses, Jesus looks directly at his disciples he frequently uses the word you. This instruction is for the apostles to hear for themselves and to serve as a model for their future ministry and messages. The teaching begins with a series of blessings and woes. Jesus had a specific structure in mind here. The blessings of, or the Beatitudes, as they're known, of verses 22 to 23, are contrasted point by point with the wo woes of verses 24 to 26. Maybe you noticed that as I read the text. Blessed are you who are poor, but woe to you who are rich. Blessed are you who are hungry now, but woe to you who are full now. Blessed are you who weep now, but woe to you who laugh now. And blessed are you whom society ostracizes for faith in the Savior, but woe to you when all people speak well of you. Our text contrasts love for God and love for self, good versus evil, life versus death. By nature, all of us are selfish, and we want to enjoy riches, good food and entertainment, and we want to be famous. How easily earthly pleasure can replace seeking heavenly goals. Jesus warns his disciples and us 
to be on our guard against that. An ancient Christian document called the Didache says, there are two ways, one of life and one of death. Now this is the way of life. First, you must love God who made you, and second, your neighbor as yourself. Whatever you want people to refrain from doing to you, you must not do to them, called the golden rule. According to St. Augustine, living self-centered lives leads to death. In our world, we witness the battle between the way of unrestricted autonomy or living according to our own desires and wishes versus the way of life, faith in the Lord. Those of us who study bioethics, the study of ethical issues involving biology and healthcare, are concerned about the lack of respect for human life in our culture. It was 46 years ago that the Supreme Court issued the Roe versus Wade decision making abortion for any reason legal in this country. In January, I was privileged to accompany 25 CUW students and Darcy Poppy to this year's March for Life in Washington, D.C. Perhaps some of you have gone along. How many of you were there? Just out of curiosity, any of you here? Okay, so a few of you, great. It was uplifting for us to see about 500,000 like-minded people brave the winter weather to make a statement for human dignity at all stages of life. Our secular society is oriented toward death. Do you know that in the United States, God's gift of life is destroyed over 3,000 times every day by abortion? The National Right to Life Educational Foundation estimates that about 60 million lives have been lost due to abortion on demand since 1973. That's over 10 times the population of the state of Wisconsin. Now some states want to remove all restrictions to abortion, even those allowed by Roe. Abortions can then be secured at any stage of pregnancy, any age, even right up until birth, and according to some, even after that. If you want to hear more about life issues and how they impact society and Christianity, Reverend Michael Salamink, Executive Director of Lutherans for Life, will be visiting campus on May 3rd. Check out the campus calendar and watch out for emails and posters as the time draws near. You'd all be invited. If any of you have been involved in an abortion and regret that decision, well, I have good news for you and for us all. The Beatitudes are intended to comfort distressed believers with the blessings won by our Savior. One of those great blessings, of course, is a future life in heaven. St. Paul writes, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. The Beatitudes emphasize that Christ is the source of every blessing. Jesus experienced poverty and hunger. Jesus wept. He suffered the ultimate rejection by humanity when he was put on trial, tortured, and crucified on the cross. But life went out over death. 1 Corinthians 15.20 reads, But in, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who, are, who have fallen asleep. Because of what Jesus has won for us, we have his promise that the evil acts we commit are forgiven. St. John writes, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. However, Jesus himself stressed that it's not enough to just hear these words of comfort. We must also do them. We reflect Christ's love for us and others by feeding them, clothing them, and taking them into our homes. We defend the lives of the defenseless, whether they are little microscopic embryos or people in intensive care units. We reflect Christ's love not by accusing, but by offering his understanding and forgiveness to men and women who have been driven to despair over past abortions. In summary, our text makes many contrasts between trust in the Lord and trust in ourselves, between good and between evil, 
and life and death. The Lord Jesus is at the center of life. He has turned evil into good, death into life. Now it's only right that we earnestly go about his work by sharing the grace of God that is in us. Amen.